Thales treasures on earth, or moth, rust, corrupt. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. <laughs> for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Thank you, Josh. I'm glad you're here, safe and sound. Pray for our folks in the media booth who make arrangements for these services to be live streamed for folks who are ill and, and hindered and gathering with us. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going back there today. Last week, we sort of set the table for the, for the idea, the, the subject of Christian liberty. That's what Paul turns to in chapter 8, and he'll be there till he gets to chapter 11, verse 1. And so we're going to be seeing this. You're going to see this, this uh, partially, uh, this weathered fence around a field on your bulletin cover for the next few Sundays to remind us that when we talk about Christian liberty, we need to heed what Walt, ha Walt Chantry has said in his book, Shadow of the Cross, Studies in Self-Denial, that the field of Christian liberty, which is vast and wide and wonderful, is when we're free in Christ, we've been set free indeed, that the field of Christian liberty is bounded by a fence, and that fence is called self-denial. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13, I hope you found that in your Bibles. Thinking today about Christian liberty and the constraints of love. Stand with me if you would. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have the text on the screen for you. And we want to put a Bible in your hands. We want you to have your own copy of the Word of God. Follow along as I read this passage. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not know, not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. What have we read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to recognize what it means to be strong in the Lord, what it means to be weak in the Lord. Not superior, not inferior. May the Lord help us to avoid these two ditches as we talk about Christian liberty. The ditch of legalism on the one hand, the ditch of licentiousness on the other hand. And may the Lord give us incredible freedom to walk in Him, conscious that we live for Him, to love Him, and to love others and serve the world. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we opened this up last week and get sort of a general introduction, looking at different passages that, that speak to the matter of, of, of Christian liberty. Uh, this, this passage here is 
is suggested to the apostle in the letter written to him uh, by the Corinthians when he says concerning this matter. He's, he's answering them when they ask about that concern. The larger problem takes up chapters 8 through 10 and then chapter 11 verse 1 on the matter of Christian liberty. Paul was a champion of Christian liberty. All right? In fact, the letter to Galatians, which we studied through several years ago, somebody uh, broke it down this way, and I thought this was interesting. He said the first two chapters of Galatians addressed the apostle of liberty, Paul himself. The next two, the gospel of liberty. And the final chapters describe the Christian life as a life of liberty. You may remember in Galatians, he was chiding them, saying, Who has, who's lured you away? Who's bewitched you to go back to something which you were set free from? And the, and the topic in Galatians has to do a lot with, with circumcision. If a person coming out of a Gentile culture who'd, who'd become a follower of Christ to participate in circumcision, to be a complete Christian, identifying with his Jewish brethren. We're not going to re-preach Galatians, but I just wanted to remind you that that's what he's talking about there. <clears throat> and so... You come to Galatians chapter 5, and these two verses need to help guide us through this discussion in 1 Corinthians. Galatians 5 verse 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. If you've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ here today, you have been saved out of the bondage of sin. The very word redemption, you've been redeemed, means to purchase out of the marketplace where slaves were, were bought and sold. And you've been set free from the bondage of sin. But you've not been set free to sin. <laughs> and so in Galatians 5.13, he says this, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. So you see what he's talking about there? Our freedom in Christ sets us free from the bondage of sin, death, hell, and the grave. And sets us free to, in love, serve one another. And what we're looking at here in 1 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with, with people who were abusing their liberty so he reminds them that liberty has limits. And the discussion will fall into four uh, areas, and we're going to try to take these up one by one. The one we're looking at today, that, that the, the limitation, liberty is limited by love for one's fellow believers, chapter 8, 1 to 13. It's also liber li limited by concern for the progress of the gospel. We never do anything in the name of having liberty to do it if it undermines the witness of the gospel. Third, by the solicitude or concern for one's own spiritual well-being. We, neither do we do anything in the name of liberty that harms us. So watch. Not harming others. Not bringing reproach upon the name of Jesus and the gospel. Not harming ourselves. And then finally, what we'll see is that there's some practical suggestions offered for the guidance of these Corinthians and for ourselves through this uh, clever path, staying out of the two ditches I mentioned previously. So what we see in this passage today, there's three things I want us to look at. First is the problem stated and the solution asserted in verses 1 to 3. Second, the necessity of knowledge. He's not calling for a mindlessness. You're going to see this. But third, the priority of love. Knowledge is important. Knowledge without love is dangerous. Knowledge is important. Love is more important because love informs knowledge. All right? Let's look at this. One of the commentators named Finley says, In theory, Paul is for freedom, but in practice for great restrictions upon the use of this word, uh, this meat offered to idols. Among these restrictions are those that are addressed in chapter 8. Let's look at verses 1 to 3. The problem stated 
and the solution asserted. Now concerning food offered to idols, so he's, now he's, he's addressing a question they ask and he's going to answer it. We know that all of us possess knowledge, and some, some uh, translations put quotes around that. He seems to be saying back to them what they have said. All of us possess knowledge. If, if that's not the case, because commentators differ, what he has said is, is true, that if, you, if everyone, I mean, even, even the most ignoramus person you know has some, some knowledge. And in Christ, we have, we have uh, real knowledge. We have, we have knowledge that can be accurate because it's filtered through the lenses of, of a worldview taught by God's word. So all of us possess knowledge. Okay, so that's a, a general assertion. But the way it's being handled in Corinth, because it's in the name of knowledge of what they, that I know that there's no such thing as idols. I know that the fact that this meat may have been offered in a, in a pagan temple didn't, didn't taint the meat. It still tastes pretty good if it's cooked right. I know these things. But he said, this knowledge puffs up. Because it's a knowledge that's, that's arguing for and justifying an action that is not constrained by love for others. I'm free. I'll do what I darn well please and nobody will challenge me. That's the mentality you're dealing with in Corinth. They have... They have swung. The pendulum has swung. They, these folks in, in Corinth were not, were not rescued from Orthodox Judaism. They were rescued from a pagan religion where there was this, this multiplicity of pagan deities. And, and if you know anything about those kind of uh, religions, I mean, the, the people, the adherents to them are slaves. If you want me to see one of the most, one of the most pitiful things you can see in the world, <clears throat> you may remember when the two young men... Uh, Caleb Stinson and, and, and Josh Zimmerman came back from their trip to Nepal several years ago. And they reported to us what they saw, the, just the, the bondage of, of the worshipers of Buddha. Awful. Well, you can see that anywhere. Look at the, look at the slavish ideas of the, of the worshipers in Islam. Awful. Tragic. It's just... It is just riddled with pain and suffering, grief. But you can play that out over and over. Look at the worshipers in the, in the Hindu religion. And so when you're rescued out of that pagan environment, and you're taught that Jesus paid it all, and you may not pick up the all to him I owe portion, but he paid it all. He set you free. That you don't have to try to, to go through some some ridiculous motions to sort of get the pleasure of God or try to get on the right side of God or, or renew that over and over and over at like pagan religions teach. When you come out of that, there's a, there's a danger that you can swing in a pendulum effect to think, whew, wow, glad I'm free. Doesn't matter what I do now. Paul's checking that. It occurred in Corinth. It occurs in America. Some people imagine that when they come to faith in Jesus Christ and because they may have been raised in one of these legalistic settings, that now suddenly they're free to do what they want. Let me tell you something. No child of God, no son of Adam, daughter of Eve who's been born again is free to do what you want. You're free to do what God wants. That's what Paul's challenging here. He says, knowledge, this kind of knowledge puffs up, makes you arrogant. He says, but love builds up, love edifies. So if you, if you have love for God, which we know from John's teachings, 1 John, if you have love for God, which is really a love cultivated in us by God, then that love instructs knowledge we have that we've gained coming into the light. If you, uh, if you get the Owasso paper, there's a, I've got an article coming out this, I think this Wednesday, uh, on 
Just a brief snapshot of what we read from 1 Corinthians 13 about love. If anyone imagines, verse 2, that he knows something about these folks that are arguing for they're not what they know about these things, he does not yet know as he ought to know. You see, if we, if, we have, if we have knowledge from God that we've seen um, in the revealed Word of God, taught to us by the Spirit, one thing it does not make us do is become arrogant. I know something. Do you know? Why don't you know that? Ugly. Ugly. An arrogant Christian is an ugly thing. No. Knowledge received by the Spirit, and I've, told, I've had to tell folks through the years it looks like to me it's just up here it's got to move a few inches south it's got to get here it's got to grip the heart when it grips the heart I promise you this any gospel truth any truth from scripture that, that enters the head and grips the heart will humble the person we become humble we do not think more highly of ourselves than we ought we think more highly of others others concern for others not what I want, but what others need. Not what I think my example allows me to do, but how does my example affect others? Paul's warning about this. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. And that's really what Paul gets down to. It's not what you know. It is who you know or what you know in the light of who you know. But he says, finally, it's who knows you. Do you know God? Does God know you? What do you mean? Well, Jesus said the day is coming, Matthew chapter 7, when many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Didn't we do that? And he says, depart from me, you who lived as if there was no law, I never knew you. Paul says, you have the, if you have a true love for God, which must express itself in love for others, that there's no way that you can go, go perpendicular in a love for God and not go horizontal in a love for others. If you have that, then he says it's evidence that you are known by God. So there's the problem is a knowledge that has led these folks to, to engage in an activity while, while right in and of itself uh, is not helpful, not edifying to others there in Corinth. And so we, knowledge puffs up, harmful, love, edifies. Secondly, the necessity of knowledge. And so he's not arguing, don't be careful what you know. My friend R.F. Gates, my mentor, used to say, he said, Bill, he said, a lot of people's theology is kind of like a like just a big salad bowl, you know. They, he said, it's not a really well-defined meal. He said, if you, if you went someplace, by the way, I think since he's died that Kentucky Fried Chicken has tried this. They have, don't they have this little cup or bucket and they've got, they've got the vegetable in it somewhere and they've got the potatoes in it somewhere and they've got chicken in it somewhere. And he said, it's not really, it's not well-defined. He said, it's like a big bowl where you just threw this in, threw that. And he said, that's not at all what we're called. We're called to have a have, have cl clarity, definition in our theology, in our thoughts about God. In other words, our thoughts about God should not be mishmashed. They ought to have some clarity to them, some focus, some definition to them. So, so Paul is not dismissing that reality. So he argues for the necessity of knowledge. In fact, if you hear what Paul's saying here, he's basically saying, look, if it's just me, I've, I believe the same thing these guys are arguing who are arguing on the basis of knowledge. I mean, I, I believe what they're saying. But Paul realized it's not, a, it's not just him. It's not about him. No one is an island in the Christian life. You don't live unto yourself. You don't die unto yourself. And everything you do, everything you say, affects the body and affects the witness of Christ to the world. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. Again, it has quotes around it in some of the translations suggesting that he's giving back to them. He said, we know that. We agree with that. That there's, there are, Idols are nothing. They're false gods. Figments of our imagination or somebody's imagination. 
and that there is no God but one. And there's, there's the, the teaching of the, what we call, you're going to call them the Libertarian Party in Corinth, that no such thing as idols. There's one true and living God. We've been taught that, Paul. You taught us that, Paul, when you came to Corinth. Remember when he was in Athens and he walked up on Mars Hill where the Areopagus met, those, those elite uh, thinkers, and they had all these idols set around, and, he's, and they had this inscription to the unknown God. You can read about it in Acts 17. Says, I notice that you're very religious people. You, you've got all these inscriptions, and, you, and you're so religious, so uh, careful that you've got this inscription to the unknown God. Maybe there's a God we've missed. We don't know about it. He says, this God that you do not know about, I want to tell you about him. He's the creator of the world and everything in it. And he just goes through and lays down a strong, only one God argument. So he appreciates, he taught them this in Corinth. There is no God but one. It's out of the, it's out of the Shema in the, in the book of Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Paul a good Jewish background is, is he's teaching proper orthodox monotheism. That is the, the belief of only one God, not a multiplicity of them. It says, for there, although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, and the term so-called is key to what he's saying here. He's not giving any ground. As indeed there are many gods, quote, and many lords. In other words, that's, that's, the, that's the climate. He's been to Corinth. He knows what, how they think there. He knows how it functions religiously. He says, I know that you live in a, in a city where that is just, you trip over their notions of gods. Yet, for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And he, he says in, again in Acts on Mars Hill, in him we live and move and have our being. In him. We breathe. We inhale and exhale by his permission. This is the sovereignty of God. We're going to look at the sovereignty of God tonight in the story of Jonah. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. He he is not only the one who, who was the the contractor, if you please, in creation. God is the architect of creation. New Testament teaches that by Jesus all the world came together and by Jesus everything is whole together, held together. We still exist by his permission. So he's argued that you can't just dismiss knowledge in the name of love. That's not the answer. Knowledge is critical. Accurate knowledge of divine things is critical. That's why we study. That's why we have Bible study at 930. That's why we, we gather for morning worship. That's why we gather back in the evening. That's why when we meet on Sundays, we're, on Wednesdays, we look substantially at things in the Scriptures. We never get together here, and we should not get together here, to close our eyes and go, hmm. Well, what are you thinking? We don't do that. It would be inappropriate to do that. What saith the scriptures? What light are we getting from the word? So Paul's arguing for that. And he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 19, he says, what do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. He said, I'm not embracing the pagan rituals. I do not want you to be participants with demons. We're going to take that up when we get to chapter 10. And so we look thirdly at the priority of love. This is where he's headed. There's a problem. He's asserted a solution. So to not be misunderstood, he's addressed the importance of knowledge, proper knowledge, correct knowledge, accurate knowledge. But the priority, what drives the train, what, what should drive the train of your Christian life and my Christian life is love. Not this maudlin sentimentality, well, I just love him too much. No, no. Love that comes from God, having been loved by God, having been energized by the Holy Spirit in the new birth, helping us to take these other kinds of love, uh, eros love, which is, a, which is a love of physical intimacy that's, that's wonderful and beautiful and precious in the bounds of marriage, or phileo love, that's, that's the friendship love. If, if you're really blessed, you, you have, uh, you're married to somebody 
who, who has, is your best friend and, uh, and you have wonderful intimacy, but all within the bounds of love. Agape love is, is the love that Jesus took, a, a word that was present in the Greek text, and he changed it. An unconditional love, a selfless love, a self-sacrificing love, a self-denying love. New commandment I give you, he said, that you love one another as I have loved you, he taught. And so the priority of love. Paul says, verse 7, however, not all possess this knowledge. In other words, not everybody in Corinth is at the same rate of growth spiritually. Some, some more mature people had come, come successfully out of the pagan culture, saw it for what it was. Not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols, some who were brought out of this, still struggled with scruples about it. You see, some came out of paganism in Corinth and, got, and said, praise God, I'm delivered from that. In fact, some would say, I always thought there was something strange about that. That didn't quite fit to me. Others delivered from the pagan culture, the pagan religion, and coming to Christ in Corinth. thought, that's, that's awful. What I was doing, what I gave myself to, what I was representing, how I blasphemed the, the creator of heaven and earth. I can't have anything to do with that. So you've got this kind of growth going on in Corinth. He said, though some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol. In other words, they wouldn't dare put that to their lips. So as to avoid the appearance of, of approving of and participating in those pagan religious rituals. And their conscience being weak is defiled. So these are the weak. These are the weak in Corinth. They're not the, they're not the inferior. They're not the foolish. They're not the childish. They simply are growing in grace at a different rate. And they don't want to do anything to displease God now that they've discovered who He is and how He sent Jesus to die for them. And they do not want to give any appearance at all that they're going back to the pagan culture they came out of or that they approve of it or it has any merit in it. Verse 8, food will not commend us to God. In other words, Type of food we eat, we don't eat. We're no worse off if we do not eat. In other words, we fail to eat this food, it doesn't make us worse. And we're not any better off if we do. It's a the, the fancy word here, if you if you do any reading on this is the word adiaphora. It's, a, it's the alpha privative in front of this word diaphora. It means the thing's indifferent. This, the meat is indifferent. You won't, if you consume meat, either being invited to the temple for a, for a celebration, going into someone's home, or just buying it out of the marketplace yourself, there's the meat is not going to cause you to have demons inhabit you when you eat that meat. Some, you say, that's silly. Some people teach that, okay? But take care that this right of yours. So he acknowledges to the strong that they, they do have the liberty. Does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge, and so now he's saying, you, you say you're doing this because of what you know about these things. If someone sees you who have knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, they might be invited by friends to come to a celebration at the, at the temple, not to participate in the temple ritual. It'd be like uh, having a marriage conference here, and you're eating in the fellowship hall. That's what they're thinking about. Although I don't know that there's any extent material that says they ever had marriage conferences in the pagan temples in Corinth. It's just an example, all right? If anyone sees you doing that, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered? I don't know if he sees a mature believer doing that, he must, well, it must be okay. I didn't think it was okay. It seemed problematic to me. And if he would participate in it, what happens? His conscience troubles him. So by your knowledge, doing what you're doing in the name of knowing what you know, 
this weak person is destroyed. Not, not sent to hell. That's not the language here. But there is the next morning. And he wonders, was that right to do? Did I sin against the Lord doing that? Am I, am I sliding back into that? It's a real struggle. And some of, you, some of you struggle with some scruples here that God being my witness, I want us to protect. I don't ever want anyone in the name of liberty to trample over your scruples. This weak person is destroyed. You, you've, you've hindered, you've harmed the brother for whom Christ died. No, it doesn't stop there. Thus, sinning against your brothers... And wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. So Paul is saying, you don't, know, you don't know what you ought to know about this. You think you know some things, but you haven't thought it through. You haven't realized that in the name of your liberty of honoring Christ, when you hurt and offend and wound a weaker brother, you sin against Christ. Because Christ died for that one too. So here's Paul's conclusion. On liberty constrained by love. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble... I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. And it's not because Paul's confused. Paul understands the teaching of Jesus. I want to give you a couple of things real quickly just to show you what Jesus said on the subject. Mark chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? He's chatting the religious leaders here. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile them? Since it enters the stomach, not his heart, but the stomach, and is expelled, it's eliminated once, it, once the energy is drawn from it. And then Mark's, remember we said we studied Mark, that Mark was giving us Peter's memoirs. Mark is writing down what Peter was telling him to write down. Thus he declared all foods clean. Exposed of how the Pharisees were thinking wrong. Luke eleven forty one, but give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. And of course, we told you last week about Peter's experience. I think we cited it on a slide in, in Acts, where he's praying on the rooftop, and a sheet comes down, and the Spirit says to him, in this vision, "Take and eat. Rise, kill, eat." And Peter's response in the vision, no, Lord, I will, I will never eat anything unclean. My, li my lips will not touch those unclean things. And the voice from heaven comes and says, do not call anything I've made unclean. Paul understands this. And he's given us all things to enjoy in moderation, not in excess. See, Paul wrote Romans also. Romans chapter 14, verse 23. But whoever has doubts, that's the weak in Corinth. He's, he's teaching the matter, this similar matter in Romans about another issue of liberty. Who, whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. And here's another definition of living by faith. Look at this. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. If you cannot do it, think it, refrain from it, so that you thoughtfully are considering this expresses my faith in Christ. It is sin. If you can't do it from faith, it's sin. Sin is transgression of the law of God, also, Romans teaches. Sin is missing the mark. Sin. Paul says, here's the problem. For you to set a bad example in the name of your liberty to your weaker brother is to cause him to sin. You're the stumbling block. Because if he can't do, do what you're doing, if he can't do it from faith, believing that's, a, that's working out of his faith in Christ, but does it because of your example, then he sinned. You've caused him to sin. You've sinned against Christ. That's critical. Look at Matthew 25, verses 40 and 45. The king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Verse 45. He will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. 
Mark 9, 37 and 41, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Verse 41, for truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Luke 10, 16, the one who hears you hears me, the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Two more. John 13, 20, truly I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. In Acts 9, 4, falling to the ground, Saul heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Brothers and sisters, the American way is to live unto yourself, to do what you decide to do in life and as it relates to the body. That is just not the biblical way. The biblical way says you harm a brother or a sister, you put a stumbling block in the path of a child, you're harming that person and sinning against not only them, but against Christ. Because he is inextricably tied to his body. The applications of this are so vast. And we're going to study through this, and, and, and one of the ditches we want to stay out of is you don't let the weakest Christian set the tone of the agenda. You've got to help them along. But neither do you plow over them. Neither do you live without regard. If, think about this, and we're going to close. If the smallest here were to follow your example in the way you live the Christian life, would they be better off? Would they have gospel avenues open up to them? Or would they be led astray? And what Jesus said of the Pharisees, blind guides leading the blind, one leads another into the ditch. Which would it be? That's a serious question. You say, That's a serious question. Were you to think to live without regard for the little ones here? is to challenge Jesus to his face. See, Christian liberty is a wonderful thing when it's used to show love to God and love to others. And if you feel bound by that, then you really don't understand Christian liberty. For freedom that Christ has set us free. But not free to do anything. Free to become more like Him, to model Him to others. Well, I pray that you're going to hang with us here. We're going to study through this section in 1 Corinthians 10. And God willing, if, I, if I'm able to speak clearly and communicate accurately, we will see when we get through this that we, we have unwittingly bound ourselves to the things, some things we need to be unshackled from and we have unwittingly been thinking without regard to what liberty is given to us to do. Be more like Christ. To love God. Love others so that they get a taste of what love for God is like. And to thought, not think primarily of myself think of others. Cultivate a servant heart so we can serve not only one another in our homes, in our, in our church life, but to serve the world around us so they get a taste of suffering servant who is the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. It is to live as if the one who lived and died and rose again has had an impact and has, a, has the command of our lives and is not just someone that we were sold an eternal life insurance policy about nor that we were sold an eternal fire insurance policy about. But He, when Christ, Paul said, when Christ who is our life appears. Christian liberty, a right understanding of it, will help you to just melt into Christ who is our life. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to confess, American eyes don't read this very well. 
God, we, we've been in, inoculated with a all about me. I. Mine. And we turn in your word and we don't, we don't see those pronouns. He. Him. It's her. It's they. It's you. God. Come in power upon us and set us free to be men and women and boys and girls in love with Christ so that we cannot help but love others. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing as we.